It's great to remind our own hearts of the faithfulness of God. And uh, sometimes we become discouraged because we end up looking at people instead of at God. And uh, this is the case of Elijah, right? So Elijah got so disheartened because the revival that he was hoping for was so superficial. And uh, he took off running and he went a long way from the Jezreel Valley all the way down to Mount Sinai. And in process, of course, he collapsed, he slept, uh, he was fed by an angel, and so on. And the question was asked him, are you doing well to be so upset? Like, what, what's the problem? And his conclusion was, I only I am left. And they're trying to kill me. In other words, um, we're an endangered species, and it looks like we're done for. And people look around at the world today, and they have the same idea. And it's just not true. The Lord said, I will build my church. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. And he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Not except for the last few years. He is at work in the world. And because we don't see it sometimes, we assume it's not happening. And this is not a good thing to do. The Lord spoke to him and said, Elijah, I have 7,000 hidden away you don't know anything about. And that 7,000 did not include Elisha, didn't include the, the woman that looked after him later on, didn't include the prophets that uh, met at Jericho, and many others that Elisha met in his ministry. There were people who trusted the Lord all over. And so we sometimes get this very negative view of things and we assume that nothing's happening because we don't hear that it's happening. So we have to have our eyes on the Lord and we need to trust him and we need to realize that the Lord keeps working. He does not get discouraged and he's going to finish the job. So I have a little story for you from a book that was written by uh, Mrs. Edward Trotter. Back in um, 1914, the book was published, and it's on the life of Lord Radstock. You know how Lord Radstock, in the 1870s, was invited into Russia by members of the upper class. He himself was landed gentry from England, and in those days, the lingua franca really was French, and uh, the upper classes spoke French, and so he was able to move among them he was in Paris when he was invited to St. Petersburg. And when he got there, a Russian princess received him into her palace. He began to preach the gospel there. There was a great deal of dissatisfaction with the emptiness of the Orthodox Church. And people started to get saved. And while they were being saved, meanwhile, among the lower class, the Stundist movement was taking hold. This was primarily among German-speaking people who had been brought to the steppes of Russia to, to farm, and uh, they began to share the word of God with the lower-class Russians. They started to get saved. They began to preach, and the gospel spread. Both among the upper classes and the lower classes, there was virtually no middle class in Russia in those days. In any case, um, Colonel Pashkov who was one of the most popular members of Russian society and one of the wealthiest, who had a palace, though Grand Ballroom could hold 1,200 people, uh, he happened on one of Radstock's gospel meetings, and he was gloriously saved and turned his palace over for gospel outreach meetings in the, in the community. During this time, uh, there was a woman who, according to Mrs. Trotter, um, was demon-possessed. And uh, I'll just read the little story to you here. During the revivals with which Lord Radstock was connected in Russia, the meetings in St. Petersburg were like those of the primitive church, and remarkable and instantaneous were the answers, that is, answers to prayer. 
a woman possessed and blaspheming, became infuriated when brought among the praying band. But the intercessors continued until midnight. At last the evil spirit was cast out, and she fell senseless to the ground. She became an earnest Christian. And her husband, a drunkard and a skeptic, seeing the miracle performed on his wife, came to the meeting, was delivered from drink, and eventually became inspector of Colonel Pashkov's forest near Moscow. Here he discovered great dishonesty that is among the various people involved in uh, the forestry business there, and the guilty parties to revenge themselves accused him to the police of blaspheming icons. You know, in the Orthodox Church, they, they pretend that icons are different than idols, and, uh, and so anyone who speaks ill of the icons was undermining the authority of the Russian Orthodox Church. Though innocent, he was sentenced to exile in Siberia for life, chained to a gang of desperate characters to march a thousand miles on foot in cold that was 20 to 40 degrees below zero. All hope of human help was abandoned. Colonel Pashkov hurried to Moscow to console him but found him radiant with joy, saying, How good the Lord is! I have been praying to work among prisoners, and this is how my prayer is answered. Colonel Pashkov just had time to slip a testament into his hand before he was marched off. A year later, in 1878, at one of the meetings of the McCall Mission in Paris, a gentleman asked to speak. He was a Jew by birth and had become a skeptic, but when traveling in Russia some months previously, he had come across a batch of prisoners, one of whom attracted him by his happy face. He heard him say, It is all joy and astonished, asked him for the meaning. The prisoner then spoke of the love of God, which filled his soul. How did he know about this love? asked the visitor, and the prisoner showed him the testament. The Jew begged to have it. It was the only book the prisoner possessed, but yielding to his entreaties, he relinquished it. Now, said the Jew, I too know that Jesus is the Messiah and the Savior. Now, lest you think these are only stories from the 1870s, what has that got to do with today? On Tuesday, I was leaving the prison where I had been preaching, and one of my dear friends there asked to tell me a little story. He said, this past week, a man who has spent 11 years in prison and is soon to be released was saved and asked to be baptized. And they have a course there where they study through what the scripture says about baptism. And he was baptized and he was so full of joy. He called his wife to tell her the joy of his heart that he was saved and, and he was the Lord's, and that the Lord had delivered him. And his wife said to him, is there someone I can talk to? And so one of the Christians there, another prisoner named Steve, got on the phone with her and she said, will you pray for me? And uh, he said, yes, I would love to pray for you. What shall we pray about? And she said, I want to be saved too. And he had the joy of pointing her to the Lord Jesus. Do you see the connection? Here's a woman, demon-possessed. The Christians don't give up on her. They pray through till midnight. The Lord delivers her. She becomes a radiant Christian. 
Her husband, who is a drunkard and an agnostic, sees the miracle of his wife's transformation. And she she has the privilege of seeing him saved. He's the man who then takes the gospel to the prisoners in Siberia by himself becoming a prisoner and has the amazing opportunity to share the gospel with a Jew and give him his little testament, who then takes the message to Paris. Here's a man, 11 years in prison, just about ready to be released. When he gets his true release from the burden of sin, gloriously saved, and then his wife professes Christ. Imagine the home now, as husband and wife are reunited in the Lord Jesus. I only I am left? Don't kid yourself. God has agents everywhere. We need to pray for them, even if we don't know their names, to pray for them. You know, the Apostle Paul quoted that story about Elijah in the book of Romans, talking about the fact that, as Jesus said, he had a treasure hidden in the field. He had a remnant of people, Jews, who were his. And so we should be praying for the people who are reaching out to prisoners, who are praying for demon-possessed, who are seeing families united in Christ, marriages restored in Christ for those who are working in the most difficult of circumstances and trusting God. He is the Savior. He is about the business. The Spirit of God is working in every heart, in every life. He has been sent into the world to do this work. And we are going to be flabbergasted. You remember the story of the seven disciples that went fishing after the resurrection. And the scripture says they caught 153 great fish. And the disciple who records that himself was a lifetime commercial fisherman. And this is what he adds. And yet for all that, the net was not broken. (sighs) What does it tell us? The gospel net holds a lot more than we think it can. God is bringing a much bigger harvest in than we ever imagined. So pray on, Christian. Look for little opportunities here and there and realize that in the end, it's God who is running after prodigals. It's the Spirit who is working in hearts. It's the Lord Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who goes after wandering sheep. We are workers together with him, but the Lord is doing the work and we can trust him to do a very good job of it.